New York State's longest-serving inmate is being granted parole today and is set to be released on June 6th. James Moore is 88 years old. Back in July of 1963, Moore pled guilty to murdering and raping 14-year-old Pamela Moss in 1962. Hello, welcome to another episode of What Were They Thinking? True Crime Podcast. I'm your host, Philip Tommaso. Hello, this is Philip Tommaso, and today is Monday, March 20th. It is the first day of spring. In my family, we always celebrated March 21st as the first day of spring, uh, but I think officially it's the 20th. But we've been wrong. All these years, we've been wrong. My brother was born on the 21st, and maybe that's why we associated it with the first day of spring. Anyway, happy birthday, Peter, tomorrow. Today, we're going to be talking about a very serious case, and I'm not making any apologies for any emotions I show in this matter. I feel very strongly about the way... I see things for this case. And if you're not familiar with uh, with what I'm talking about, I am calling episode five, A Nightmare in Penfield. Penfield is in Rochester, New York, in the county of Monroe, where I live. Quick synopsis is, with some 48,000 prisoners in New York, James Robert Moore became known as the longest serving prisoner in New York. That was a title bestowed upon this criminal after serving only and i say only for many reasons which we will get into after serving only 59 years of a life sentence he was released on parole in june 2022 just last year with a second chance at life unfortunately the 14 year old girl in penfield that he murdered and then raped is not so lucky. She does not get a second chance at life. So let's talk about this nightmare in Penfield, the death of Pamela Moss. So there's a New York organization out there known as the Release Aging People in Prison Campaign. And so as I was doing my research on this case, I came across this campaign that was key in helping James Moore get out of prison. So <clears throat> just with that being said, I, I have what I need to say ready to go. I'm going to try not to ad lib too much. But my emotions do get the better of me in this one. And they got the better of me while I was working on it and doing the research. So uh, there's links. I have links for everything, all my research, and there's links to their website on my page for this episode as well. So it's led by formerly incarcerated prisoners and their families and friends, the Release Aging People in Prison campaign. They allege their purpose is to, and I quote, to end the racist law and order policies that have more than doubled the number of elders behind bars over the past 20 years to expand the use of parole, compassionate release, and clemency, and to end life imprisonment. By advocating to free incarcerated elders, women and men who have served decades in prison for crimes, including those of violence, who have taken responsibility, transformed their lives, developed profound skills and abilities, and who pose little, if any, public safety risk. They go on to say, we strike at the system of endless punishment that fuels mass incarceration and damages black and other communities of color. So this is some organization. That's the best I can say. Their plight on face value, appears noble. It sounds it. In my opinion, it is not. 
it misses the mark. Violent criminals, criminals who commit murder and rape and even attempted murder, or maybe they harm children, they are a menace. And if they get sentenced to decades in prison or life in prison, the reason is simple. The life or the lives they shattered or ended, where is the second chance for those people? The victim or victims don't get any mercy after the fact. Why? Because they've already been assaulted or they are already dead. I am not a fan of this group, of this campaign. I am not an advocate for this group and I am annoyed and incensed by the group also making their plight about race. Sorry, not sorry. Why the rant? Let me tell you. The release against, or the release for aging people in prison campaign got me going when I looked into one particular case, Pamela Moss from Penfield, New York. Who is Pamela Moss, you might be asking? Good question. Back in 1962, in the town of Penfield, about 15 minutes away from where I live, 14-year-old Pamela Moss, a freshman at Penfield High School, walked through the woods by her house on Sawmill Drive after school. She was strangled to death and then raped. Now, I want to say this one more time, because the order in which the events happened makes this crime even more deplorable and heinous. She was strangled to death, and then she was raped. Her body was discovered several days later, on a Saturday, in a nearby quarry, uh, a water-filled gravel pit. During her funeral at St. Joseph's and the burial at Holy Sepulchre, Pamela's parents, her brother Gregory, who was in sixth grade, and her sister Cynthia in third grade at St. Joseph's School occupied front row pews. The youngest sibling, Mary, who was just three years old, was being watched by a neighbor for the day. Over 400 family and friends attended the church. Mrs. Ross's brother-in-law flew in from Italy to attend. Deputies were assigned to the funeral service and at the cemetery where Pamela Moss was laid to rest, watch, watching closely those in attendance. They were looking for anyone who may have appeared suspicious or wasn't fitting in. It's common for a murderer to attend funerals or the burials or vigils of their victims. Sick as that is, the police know they do this and they were on the lookout. The deputies did not see anyone out of the ordinary. Police received countless tips in person and on the phone regarding who they thought might be responsible for the savage death of Pamela Moss. Around the time of the funeral, the sheriff, who was Albert, Albert W. Skinner at the time, said every scrap of information they received was checked out and checked out negatively. And at the time, there was nothing new in the case. The lives of children in Monroe County changed during all of this in the 1960s. Parents began instituting new rules with limitations on outside activity. They were frightened. They weren't used to this. We're talking about homes where you didn't lock your doors at night. Crime did not creep into neighborhoods then the way that it does now. Forget about now. So, okay. So, around two weeks later, there's a break in the case. Someone admitted killing and then raping 14-year-old Pamela Ross. They admitted it. There was a banner headline in the news. Suspect admits Pam's killing, and it's announced the arrest of James Robert Moore. At the time of the murder, Moore was 28 years old and lived in Webster, New York. 
that's just north of of Penfield. And just <laughs> just to be geographically, and it's just east of where I am in Greece. Um, so he lived in Webster with his wife and three children of his own. Three children of his own. He worked as a gardener in the Moss neighborhood. Moore was already on probation. I want you to listen to this. Moore was already on probation for molesting two young girls in the Buffalo area. His probation is what caught the eye of law enforcement. In his confession, Moore stated the attack wasn't planned, but when he saw Pamela Moss, 14 years old, he approached her as she used a shortcut through the woods on the way to a babysitting job. So she gets out of school. She's going to a babysitting job. She's cutting through the woods. He wasn't planning on attacking her, but he saw her. So he approached her. He distracted Pamela with talk about how beautiful the woods were. Before he snatched her around the waist, he then suffocated her by putting his arm over her mouth. After she was dead, Moore raped her corpse and then discarded her body face down in a nearby quarry. I, speechless. This is what monsters are made of. I'm glad they got him. I'm glad he was caught. 28 years old with a family of his own with three children. And this is his behavior. After molesting two girls in the Buffalo area. Young girls in the Buffalo area. While in custody, Moore attempted suicide when he thought he faced the death penalty. Oh, he was afraid he might receive the electric chair at Sing Sing. That's what was probably on the table. That freaked him out. So he attempted suicide. Does that even make sense? It doesn't make any sense. He's afraid to die, but he's going to attempt killing himself to avoid death. Moore agreed to a plea. In exchange for a guilty for first-degree murder, he would spend the rest of his natural life in prison. In an article by Peter Lovenheim in September of 2019, he surmised, Peter did, because Pamela's mother was pregnant at the time of the plea, she perhaps agreed to spare Moore's life in order to spare herself the additional stress of a trial. Peter later found out during an interview with Pamela's father that he was wrong. Pamela's father wanted the death penalty. Pamela's mother only opposed it. This is a quote. She only opposed it because she thought her daughter's killer would suffer more by life in prison. Totally agree with her. I agree with that line of thinking. James Moore was sent to Attica Prison. 20 years later is when he first became eligible for parole. This was in 1982. See, the laws had changed. And where he was given this life sentence, there should never have been an eligibility for parole. But the laws changed. And everyone... It's an eligibility opportunity, or most everybody. In 1982, he was denied. But every two years after that, he became eligible once again. More statement of facts basically remain the same at every two-year parole board hearing. So Peter Lovenheim explains Moore acknowledged responsibility for the murder of Pamela Moss and while in prison maintained an exemplary record that he completed all psychological counseling, which included sex offender counseling. I mean, yeah, I feel like this is something you should have been seeking on your own when you were free, knowing with the probation you were on to begin with, that you had an issue with young women and your inability to control sick, demented urges. And here's, here's where I start losing 
my composure. While in prison, Moore was given the opportunity to continue his education and earned three college level degrees, as well as becoming a teacher of Buddhist meditation. <laughs> I'm, I guess I can't hide my, my own self disgust, my own disgust here in, in, yes, I understand these people are in prison. I understand these people need something, need opportunities, but three college level degrees, free. So while in prison, see what I'm doing here is I'm trying to segue into my next part of the story because I can't stay on that one for too long or we'll just go on such a tangent. So also I'm going to try and change this up also while in prison in 1975 james moore met joyce smith she was a social worker and a prison volunteer in 1989 i don't know if you're listening i don't know if you have your your volume on enough but in 1989 the two were married i know it's not that uncommon for prisoners to meet fall in love if you can see me i'm doing quotation marks fall in love, and then get married. However, what, I don't know Joyce. I don't know anything about her. She's, she's a social worker. What I question is her degree. I guess I question her degree. Here she is falling in love with and marrying a man who molested young girls in Buffalo and then murdered and raped a girl in penfield and she thought i'm just i'm just guessing here but she thought yeah this is the man i want to spend the rest of my life with right she has to think something like that something like that must have run through her head because that's what runs through the head of people who get engaged yeah this is the person i would like to spend the rest of my life with but usually Usually, there's the good qualities that they're looking at. Oh, he's got a great job. Oh, he's got a lot of money. Oh, she really enjoys family, and she she she's very nurturing to her nieces and nephews. This is gonna be she's gonna be a great wife and a great mother, and he's gonna be a great husband and careers. No, I I guess the aspects were the three college level degrees, Buddhist meditation uh, teacher, and really has an affliction for young, young children. That's what I get out of it. So Joyce, you know, congratulations, Mazel Tov. 34 years later, which is where we are now, 2023, the two are still together. 34 years they've been married. So this leads me to believe that his previous wife divorced him, and hopefully she kept the three children away from more from the day of the murder, or the day he confessed to murdering Pamela Moss uh, and the rest of his sadistic crimes, I kudos to her for walking away. And Joyce, mm -hmm. reap what you sow. So this is I know I'm trying. See, I'm trying so so hard just to keep my composure. I apologize. I told you at the beginning. This was going to be an emotional one. In January 1999, Moore thought he figured out the real reason behind his monstrous behavior in 1962. And based on his discovery, believed his life sentence should be thrown out. According to the Associated Press, Moore was blaming his sick and vicious behavior on exposure to pesticides. Uh, dial drink. Insecticide was banned in New York in 1985 because it can cause damage to the liver and the central nervous system. Rachel Carson wrote a book in 1962 called Silent Spring. In this book, she examined the effects of pesticides on the environment and, clay, and claimed it caused mania. I tried doing a little digging on uh, Rachel Carson. I couldn't find like any medical degrees or... Um, anything to back up her claims. I mean, there, this, this uh, incesticide is 
banned. It has been banned since 1985. It's not good. I don't know about it causing mania. At a brief hearing before Monroe County Judge William Bristol, Moore said, this is his quote, I was aware that the handling of toxins were responsible for the increasing number of episodes of mania I was experiencing during the last few years I worked as a landscaper. I know that there were the true cause. I know that they were the true cause of the depraved act on the young girl I murdered. This was his statement. More 62 at this time argued he should be freed because his symptoms have disappeared. Now, the symptoms do disappear quickly when no longer exposed to the insecticide, but this is a different matter. He said he believed he should be sent to an institution for the criminally insane rather than remain in prison when he pleaded guilty to first-degree murder. Prosecutor Robert Mastercola came back with, and I love this, it's irrelevant. The prosecutor argued against Moore's plea, stating, it doesn't matter why he did it, he admitted what he did, and he accepted the plea sentence. So I went to the CDC website, and it states, people who are on purpose or accidentally ate large amounts of aldrin or dialdrin have suffered convulsions, some have died. Workers who were exposed to lower amounts of these chemicals, but for a longer period of time, had headaches, dizziness, irritability, vomiting, and uncontrolled muscle movement. Once they were away from exposure, these chemicals, once they were away from exposure to these chemicals, the workers got better quickly. So nothing in, in the CDC website about mania. 20 times James Moore bid for parole and 20 times he was denied. It seemed as if everything was pretty right in the world. A convicted murderer, a rapist, would remain behind bars and would die behind bars. But then, what then? There shouldn't be a but then. Tuesday, May 10th, 2022, with late spring weather temperatures in the 70s and mostly sunny skies with some light cloud coverage, shock, awe, and utter disbelief filled the Moss family because you better believe they were at every parole board hearing. So, at the time, Moore was being held at the Coxsackie Correctional Facility in Greene County. At 88 years old, and I don't care how old James Moore is, but at 88 years old, James Robert Moore was granted parole and set for release in June of 2022. With some 48,000 prisoners in New York, as I said in the beginning, Moore had acquired the title longest serving prisoner in New York. Good for him. And what a shame that was all about to change. After serving only the 59 years of his life sentence, James Moore was going to be a free man. The Mosses agreed to the initial plea of a life sentence over Sing Sing's electric chair and the death penalty because there were, they were led to believe they were given assurances the monster who murdered and then raped their daughter would be locked away forever. That was the reason. That was why he did not go to the electric chair. The fact it was not even a first offense has to play into all of this. The killer was already on probation for molesting the girls in Buffalo. And I hate to beat a dead horse. But if we don't reiterate these facts over and over, I'm afraid someone listening is going to miss them. The reason uh, no other young girls were molested or murdered or raped by James Moore between 1962 and 2022 is because James Moore spent his days and nights exactly where he was meant to spend them. In prison, behind bars, plucked out of society and kept locked away from normal people and from girls, from women. 
it's absolutely impossible to murder and rape and molest young girls when you're in prison. It's simple physics. It's basic scientific truth. The Moss's expectations that Moore would die in prison were not heartless. They weren't cold. They were comforting and justifiable. This is why organizations like Release Aging People in Prison Campaign miss the mark. This is why I despise an organization like Release Aging People in Prison Campaign. I can't even give them any benefit of the doubt because right in their About section on their website, they state, as I stated earlier, by advocating to free incarcerated elders, women and men who have served decades in prison for crimes, including those of violence, including those of violence. I don't care how old Moore is or was when they assisted in getting the degenerate parole. He could have been 99 years old. There are people who do not and should not ever be released. I know. I sound heartless, right? I sound cold. Let me see if I can paint this picture so you see it as clearly as I see it. At 14 years old, Pamela Moss was a freshman in high school, and she was murdered. Then she was raped. Then she was discarded like trash. That's it. That is the end of her story. James Moore, in his late 20s, had a wife and three kids. He molested girls in Buffalo. He murdered and then raped Pamela, and he went to prison. But his story doesn't end there. Because while in prison, James Moore earns three college degrees. Pamela never got to go to college. She didn't get to graduate from high school. She was dead. Moore became a teacher in Buddhist meditation. Pamela didn't go to junior prom or senior prom or get to graduate. And then the two girls from Buffalo, they probably spent years in therapy. And if they're lucky, they've managed a healthy relationship or two in the past few decades. If they're lucky, um, listen, Moore, while in prison, convinced a woman to marry him. While in prison, he got married. Pamela missed out on dating boyfriends, marriage, having her children of her own, uh, making her parents' grandparents. Why? Because Moore murdered and then raped her. Moore agreed to accept the plea of guilty of first-degree murder in lieu of the death penalty. He understood at the time he would spend the rest of his natural life in prison. And less than one year ago, Moore was set free or just over one year ago. I personally don't care how old he is or how many years he's been in prison for the reasons I just shared. My Aunt Linda is the one that told me about this case, and she is an avid listener of the podcast. So a shout-out to my Aunt Lynn. And, uh, but once I started reading up on this, uh, this case and doing my own research, I was so disgusted by the parole announcement that I had to bump this episode up to the top. I couldn't let it sit in the hopper for the next several weeks. So I, I just want you to know, I, I had some different episodes planned, but this one, this one is the one I decided to go with. Whew, I have to take a deep breath here. So I know I let out a ton of emotion during this episode. And like I said, I'm not going to apologize for that. My anger and my frustration and my empathy and my sympathy for the Moss family, it's genuine. Uh, I, I'm Italian. I don't know if you know that I'm Italian. I'm the whole time I'm talking here, and I don't do video. I have a uh, face for radio, um, but the whole time I'm talking, my hands are all over the place, and uh, I, I I don't I don't want to hold back my feelings while recording the podcast. I think it's important to always be genuine. You know, I try to give it a professional sound and and such, but but the emotions are real. Anyway. Uh, anyway, I hope you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, because I would love some feedback on this episode. I would like to hear your thoughts on everything discussed. You know, and I'm open and receptive to those kinds of messages, uh, questions, concerns. Maybe you have ideas for upcoming episodes like my Aunt Linda did, which I am so grateful for. 
Anyway, a nightmare in Penfield was truly a nightmare, and unfortunately, that nightmare is ongoing. Thank you for listening to What Were They Thinking? True Crime Podcast. As always, like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. New episodes every Monday.